I think we're going to start. Um, today, um, we want to talk about um, software architecture, and we want to combine this um, with configuration management. But before we do our deep dive into the topic, um, I guess we better start with introducing ourselves. So um, I'd like to start. My name is Ole Michaelis. Um, we're both from Hamburg. Um, you can find me on Twitter at Codestars. My blog is codestars.eu. And this is Zunko. Yeah, hi. I also work um, in Hamburg. And yeah, there are my, there's my Twitter handle and blog and GitHub as well. All right. So um, we both work for a company called Jimdo. Um, Jimdo is a do-it-yourself website creator. Um, it's around till seven years almost. So it's kind of a grown software, grown architecture. And our target is that everyone can create um, websites easily. But that's not the topic of today's talk. <laughs> uh, so the topic of today's talk and the goal of this presentation is um, Zünke and I, we are both not real um, system administrators or ops guys. We are really uh, software engineers. So, but somehow uh, it like forced us to do some ops in our company. So what we did is like we applied all the software architecture patterns we know to the configuration management we do. So it's really about um, software patterns, which also applies to infrastructure management code. Um, we'll show you some anti-patterns, like how not to do it. But we'll also show you the other side, like the best practices and how we do it, and w the way we found that's really like a good way to do it because it's like maintainable and stuff. Um, we should mention that this talk is somehow bound to Puppet because we do Puppet in our company and all the examples are in Puppet. But um, hopefully all the best practices are applicable to Chef and other configuration management tools too. So um, we'd like to start with a little poll. Um, and the first question, which is really obvious, is like, who patched their SSL yesterday? <laughs> OK, I assume the rest is like us. Uh, your operation system is that old that you don't have to patch it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, who's the sysadmin? Oh, that's almost. <laughs> we did this talk at a, at a development conference, and there was just one ops guy. He <laughs> <laughs> seemed really lost. So who's, who's the developer? Ah, uh, two. Okay, it's really funny. It's like the other way around. <laughs> so who used configuration management at all? That's oh, almost everyone. That's great. So who do Puppet? That's great. <laughs> Who the chef? Oh. Two? <laughs> Good audience shy. for us. It's OK. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Uh, I assume the rest do Ansible and other weird stuff. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, no, that was not scripts. biased Not biased at all. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Uh, who knew these pictures? Who have seen them? One. Oh, one, yeah. OK, that's cool, because uh, this is like our topic today. <laughs> Um, these are some pictures I stole from this motivational posters about Solid. Um, Solid is a software principle which are five abbreviations <clears throat> for patterns. And the first one, the S, is the single responsibility principle. It's that a class should only have one single responsibility. And the O is the open close principle. Um, it says that software entities should be open for extension but closed for modification. The L stands for the Liskov substitution principle. And that, that's being said that ob objects in a program should be replaced with instances of their subtypes without altering the correctness of the program. Um, it's kind of uh, related to design by contract. I don't worry if, if it's like really weird stuff I'm talking about. This is the topic of today. So we have almost one hour left to dig into detail what this really means. Um, the I is the interface recognition principle. It means many client-specific interfaces are better than one general purpose interface. And the D is the dependency inversion principle. So one should only depend upon abstractions and do not depend upon concre concretions. <laughs> <laughs> um, dependency injection, you might hear of it, is like one implementation or one method following this principle. And, you know, to, to do is more like in a, we want to present this in a more lively way. <laughs> so um, we presented or we prepared a, a little role play. 
Ja. All right, as you see, um, I'm the typical ops guy. Uh, <laughs> I wear black shirts, long hair. I also have hair, man, but I will fix my, my school only here later on. Um, all right, so let's start. Um, Sönke, hey, yeah, how are you hi. doing? Um, how are you? I've been to many conferences in the last days, and I heard so much stuff about configuration management, and I'm, I'm wondering, what is, it, what is it all about? So, wh what is it? Yeah, um, and why? So, because usually it's like you just have your bash scripts, and you actually like it, maybe? I love my bash script. They're yeah. awesome. They're all okay. on one NFS server, and you know this service, it, he's, it's, it's everywhere, and it's super easy to manage for me. Yeah, that's cool. Okay, so um, let's go a little bit into detail. So, what the heck is configuration management? Um, configuration management has some more definitions, but this is one definition, and it's like um, declared by four words, and the first is. Um, it's um, idempotent, or idempotent, I don't know how it is in English. Um, so, who of you has already heard of idempotency, this pattern, or, okay? Bunch of people. So, actually, idempotence means that the current state of the system doesn't matter. Um, you can just think of, for example, HTTP verbs, like when you do, when you do a get, or you do a delete on some HTTP object on your server, it should be idempotent. So you can do it, um, you can just repeat it, and the state on the server doesn't get really um, changed. It, it cha it's got changed, so if you delete uh, an item once, then it's okay. If you say twice delete it, then it's not deleted anymore, but the server stays, uh, still says um, it's okay. So this is idempotent. And the second thing is like um, declarative, so it's like um, SQL, like you don't say um, how things are going to be done, you just say what to do. And so SQL, Chef and Puppet, for example, are declarative, it's not like Bash where you, where you tell like copy stuff there and move and unzip and tar and stuff like that. Um, Yes, so, and the um, third thing is convergent, so um, you just, in configuration management, this is somehow a little bit like declarative, you say what, um, what should be done but not how, and the configuration management just takes care of what to do. So it is, it's all, also re-entrant, so if it broke, um, if the last run broke, um, then it's just getting, the rest is getting applied, and not like your bash script, which might just fail <laughs> in the middle, and then you have some undesired state <laughs> of your system, and it's just like, oh my god, I don't know what to do. And yeah, and the last thing, uh, the last thing is um, abstract, um, and it means that, for example, package management is abstracted for you, so you don't have to care about is it apt or yum or whatever. All right, that that's, that sounds really cool. Yeah. Um, but you know, why why is it better than my Bash and SSH stuff? And you know, what's <laughs> what? Why should you use it? Yeah, I would say um, you could look maybe at this at this photos. So, what is software architecture about? You you can you can see um, what goods architecture is, it's like 2,000 years, the aqueduct in Rome, and versus this bridge, and so with good software architecture you get some overall structure of your system, um, you can see where the boundaries are, um, you can interchange single components, you don't have this spaghetti code and dependencies everywhere, and um, you also have standards with which other people can rely on and stuff like that. And you actually, you can st scale your company much better because you don't have, because usually there's this one admin guy and he has all the special knowledge about his, his or her best scripts, and um, th this is uh, not good for scaling companies, so it's good to have some standards how to do it. Yeah. Um, that's, that sounds really good. So I, I think I want to try it. Uh, I think I want to go uh, with Puppet because, you know, you're talking about Puppet all the time and I heard it's like the best contract management in the world. So um, 
I, I was like back in the, in, the, in, the, in the days, like last week, I, I did my first puppet recipe. So, so check out my first puppet recipe. Um, it's really cool. So I have three web apps running on three nodes. So the first is like web app one, um, it needs an Apache, and there's web app two, uh, it has fast CGI, and then, you know, web app three is like our legacy system, and it has, it has like both, so it has, mm -hmm. um, and it has some, some special modules in the PHP ini. Um, so, uh, well, how do you think? I mean, I really like it. It's, it's yeah. way better than the best stuff. So, what yeah, do you think? So, so, it's really cool for a start. So, um, actually, what you did is like you wrote your first PHP class and you're just installing packages and um, you have this like special file here. But um, so, from a software engineering point of view, there are several mistakes in that which could be improved. So, the first thing is um, global state. Um, we have a global variable here, and so the problem of global variables is always that you um, don't have, um, for example, reusability anymore or testability, and you have like pollution of global namespaces. Just imagine there is another class which also has has fast CGI, and they are like battling <laughs> who's the winner of <laughs> has fast CGI. Um, yeah. So, and the next one is. Um, actually, our PHP, um, PHP 5 model has to know something about roles. So you introduce some kind of role model here, like this is my web app C role. And this is also not good because it's just not in this context. This module should not know about other stuff around or higher layers. And the last one is... Um, Oh, we, get, we will get to this later, it's like the, um, the file server here. You just use your Puppet as a file server for your stuff, and, but we will get to this later. So, um, yeah, this one. So, how can we get rid of, um, how can we get rid of the global state? Um, what we can do is we can just, so, just let's, See this example again. So we have, like, um, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, we have this global state, like this has fast CGI variable and this role variable, and that's not good. So, how can we make it better? We can get rid of the global, um, global scope, and how do we do it? We just pass into the class the stuff we want to know instead of calling it um, from the inside. And this is really cool because now this. PHP 5 class is kind of uh, self-contained, has, no um, has no side effects anymore because it doesn't um, talk to the global state or other um, outside components or modules. And yeah, it does not pollute the global namespace, like what I said before. And the cool thing about it is reusable in other environments. So you could, for example, open source it. <laughs> that's really cool. Yeah, that's really cool. And yeah, on the calling side, it looks like this. You just pass in the variables instead of um, calling it from the outside. So now your two nodes, like web, uh, web 1 and web 2, they, just, they, um, they include the PHP 5 class still, um, but they have these injections here. Yeah, and that's... Um, that's cool because um, yeah, now we, can, we could also get rid of these variables and just pass it in here. So again, no global state and also no global variables like role and has fast CGI or whatever role um, variables that are not needed anymore anywhere. Okay, and this is actually called um, dependency injection and this is our first pattern of solid. It's the D in solid. And this is, yeah, it's like called dependency inversion or dependency injection. There are many, um, many words for it and names. Yeah, and this is really cool. And I would say, now we got our first. That's mission, amazing. Mission High accomplished. Five. Okay, <laughs> nice. Uh, so 
Um, I, I think I get it now. Um, this, this default dependency inversion is pretty, pretty important to me because I really learned that global state is bad. Uh, so whenever I, I see like, some, some of my colleagues doing this global state stuff, I would totally go ahead and say, no, don't do it. Use dependency inversion because it's way better. Um, we don't have any side effects. It's reusable. Uh, re reusable sorry. And, um, we can also inject parameters. So it's way easier to maintain. And I, I totally love that fact. So that's really great. Um, but yeah, so, but yeah, there's still many things to do. For example, um, for example, we still have all these um, ifs in here, like if has fast AGI, if has Apache, and but, so. But, but you know, it, it's not that bad. I, I feel like it's, it's well arranged, and it's, it's super easy for me to change that later on, because yeah. it's, it's really like overviewable, and it's not that much. And you so could just add more ifs. I yeah. would just add some more when <laughs> I have like another special cases. Yeah. That's OK, but um, in the end, trust me, I'm a developer, and so actually, you will end up with stuff like this. And uh, so actually, this is one live example from our Puppet code base. So we, are <laughs> we also start with some <laughs> technical depth. <laughs> and yeah, so this is really a, an example from a grown code base. And the problem here is if you want to change anything and you want to make sure that you don't break anything, then you're really lost. And um, actually, there's an anti-pattern word for it. It's from the C2 wiki. Um, and it's called the arrow anti-pattern because your code somehow looks like an arrow. <laughs> so um, yeah, there's also a name for it. And actually, when you're trying to do some refactoring or try to change it, then you will end up like this cat. You maybe know this cat. Who knows this cat? <laughs> Yeah, really poor cat. Okay. Um, but okay, so I think I get it. So um, can can we split the PHP five class into smaller pieces without breaking stuff? So how can we accomplish it? I mean, you said you won't break stuff, but I, I don't want to break stuff. But yes. show me. I, I don't know how to do it. Yeah. So actually, um, what we do in software engineering is like testing, test all the things because then we can make sure we don't break anything and we can also make sure that we always have some working code. And um, so luckily in the configuration management world, there's a lot of tools that help us. So we could start like with RSpec Puppet or test in, in the Puppet world and Test Kitchen in the Chef world, for example. And what is now cool, because we have a testing tool, we get another pattern from software engineering, and it's called test-driven development. Who knows this cycle, like red-green refactor? Ah, OK, a bunch of people. So the cool thing here is that our infrastructure or our server definitions or node definitions are now code. We really can express it with code. And in software development, what we can do in software development is we can do test-driven um, programming. And now we can do apply this and can do test-driven infrastructure. And we can use the cycle. And the cycle says, write a, write, write a failing test like you don't implement, uh, implement anything. Um, then write anything to make this test green, maybe also with copy and paste. It doesn't matter. And then do refactor because then you can just like get rid of copy and paste and stuff like that because you have your tests and you and, and you make sure that you never will um, implement one line without a test and this is really cool and there's also one um, one important uh, another important thing about test driven development if something is not testable then your stuff might be wrong, your design might be wrong, because good software is usually testable. <laughs> Last point of, um, of all, all the advantages test-driven development gives you is um, you, get, you, you have to think before you implement. 
And this is really important because there are several cases when you have to think, ah, what, um, what should my software do? Then you have to think beforehand. And sometimes it's like, oh my god, no, I don't want to do this. And then you, get <laughs> then you will just try to implement it in another way or get rid of the feature because you just thought, oh my god, ah, this won't work. Ah, I'll better let it be. Yeah. So, um, OK, how can we get into test-driven development with our small example? What we could do is the first step is we have to document the current state, what our stuff does. And actually, we have our two nodes, and, or three nodes, sorry. And we can just add these really simple tests, like my node web one should contain the package PHP fast CGI. This is actually what is expressed in the manifest of Puppet. And, and so on, like with web, uh, web two and web three. And this is called integration testing because we now test that a node actually contains a package. But there is actually, there should be one layer in between those both, and we will get to this now. Uh, and the special web app C uh, stuff is now left out. We will get back to this later. OK, so now how is TDD going to work? Um, what you could do now is you could um, just, you, you have, you have these tests like on, on the slide before, and now you can just go ahead and write some new classes like PHP Fast CGI and PHP Apache. And you will just test that it's um, going to be installed. Now we have two small classes. <laughs> they do one thing. And this is really cool because this is the next pattern. It's called single responsibility. It's one piece of software, a component, or a class, or a container does, does just one single thing with one responsibility. And this is, um, and what, what we can do now, um, yeah, so we had this, so we, we came from this, like, web, M, uh, web 1 should contain PHP fast CGI, but now we have this both new classes, like PHP 5 Apache and PHP fast, uh, 5 fast CGI, sorry. And now our tests look like, okay, it should do both. It should contain the, uh, include the class, and it should also contain the package. And this is now redundant, because actually, we now can get rid um, of those tests, because those tests, um, like the, um, like, like the uh, PHP 5 Apache class, um, ha they have their own tests, like I should include the package, so I don't need to do it anymore in my node definition tests. Yeah, and this is really cool because now we have like clear layering, and because we now test that our node includes some modules and we um, um, like the small classes and the class, the classes have their own tests. And we can now compose it together like we want. And this is cool. And actually, it's like this. We come from spaghetti code to lasagna code, like clearly layered code. So you may know this from Java, from the big stack trace. This is actually lasagna code. <laughs> it also has its disadvantages, but um, usually it's better than spaghetti code. Yeah. And actually, um, this is the next pattern. It's the open-close principle. That means that our, um, that our software or, or small class or component should be open um, for extension. And um, the really important point here is that you don't add new functionality by, for example, adding new ifs but you do it by adding new classes and compose stuff together. And this is like um, what this little text here says, like um, rather than by changing existing code. And this is really important, and this is one um, really um, important pattern to have maintainable software, or in this case, configuration management. 
because you do, won't get these big like god classes which do everything. Yeah, and actually, it's high five time. Yeah, bam. Woo! Because we okay, had <laughs> this is really cool. Um, I, I really like that fact, and I think I, I almost get that. So when I want to add a feature. Um, and I find myself like modifying actual existing code. It's it's already what we call a, a code smell. Like you, you see, yes. it was called code smell um, because you should realize that new stuff is always like new features is always like a new class. And um, when I want to add a feature, it's again like writing code and. When I use tests and the refactoring cycle you showed me, um, I can really ensure that I bro that I won't break existing functionality, which is really really cool yeah. again. So and you realize it before your customers do, because there is <laughs> this no one is called this one is called customer testing, right? Yes, <laughs> it's uh, uh, test test units, not unit tests. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, I I think um, when I want to scale the things, it's like. Um, when I want to scale now, uh, what I would do, because we just made it so easy, really, uh, I would just go ahead and like copy the node definition and uh, change the things I, I want to. So yes. I want to do. So for uh, example, this is really cool. Yeah, so for example, when when you get more like more lo you get more load, and now you can just add another node. Because this, I would totally do that. Yeah. So when we have this success mm -hmm. disaster that I need more nodes, I would just go ahead in my manifest and add these nodes. Like yeah. So actually, this is. Um, the old copy and paste anti pattern. So, um, yeah, and copy and paste is really easy to do, and this is why it's so popular. <laughs> and, but it's getting evil because imagine you got hundreds of nodes, then you have this node definition 100 times, and you got the content copy and pasted 100 times, and now imagine you have to change one thing. You have to change it 100 times, or someone else has to make the change, but he doesn't know, or she doesn't yeah. know about the, yeah. um, about the other 100 occurrences, okay. and then you're getting lost. <laughs> okay, okay, so you said I be just better don't copy, um, but... Uh, the actual question is like, how how can I achieve it then when I don't do this copy and paste stuff? Yeah. So what you what you actually could do is like, you add another layer into your lasagna code. For example, what you could do is um, using um, composition, you could say, ah, my web app one is some kind of a server role because. It, uh, web app one and one a or how we call it is just it's just the same and it's somehow expressed in a server role like a role says it does specific things and so um, what we could do is just add this layer like a role class and it says it's a web app a so it has actually a name what it's doing and it just says include the Apache module and now our um, now our nodes are just including this role, so another layer, like I said, and this is um, actually called um, composition. Is, and composition is always better than copy and paste because because now you can just add more stuff into your role. Like it also has to include whatever, and you don't have to do any copy and paste. And this is really cool because. Yeah, now you got rid of this copy and paste stuff and it's clean again. All right, high five time. Bam. Cool. <laughs> so I think I think I got it. So this role concept is like really easy because I can compose stuff. I have again reusable code, which is like the one principle of, of software design, I guess. And um, nodes are just described by roles. So the node should only contain one role, which is really handy uh, when I want to scale. And then I have little changes. I don't have to do it for every node because they all include this one role. So I can make this actual change in the role. And um, this composition stuff makes it really easy to add new nodes. Yeah, you got uh, it. This, cool. is, this is super amazing. So I really like that. Uh, <laughs> um, so OK, uh, I got rid of the global state. We have small classes, and we got tests. But uh, you know, why has this PHP 5 to know um, about our role model? Isn't this like breaking the, the proper layering you just mentioned? Yes, um, I'm, I'm, I mentioned it a few minutes ago, like it still has to know about the role model. And so we have to look what can we do about this? Because actually, if we want to have this fast CGI class somehow interchangeable or um, 
then it doesn't um, have, uh, just must not know about our role model because the role model is what we did and the PHP 5 class should live without any knowledge of it. Yeah, and actually, again, we have some principle. It's called the Hollywood principle. It's the same as the dependency inversion um, principle, but it's a little bit funnier because like in Hollywood, <laughs> it's always like, don't call us, we call you. So act actors usually get called by the agency and the, uh, so the agency can just keep their options open and this, this is really important. Yeah, as I said, it's just another name for the dependency inversion. So what we could do now is like, we had this special case and how to get rid of the special case, we could just add another or extract the code with the special case out and move it into some special class. I call it like role web app C, special PHP stuff. And um, now it's in, in, in its own class. And what we could do now is inject, um, inject this package or this, this special class into our fast CGI class and give it, give it some name that, is, that actually, um, actually expresses what it's doing. Like it should include this class or it, it should include like this stuff after the package install of the PHP 5. This is like what we do here like with this package PHP 5 and this arrow like class. This is like the pu puppet syntax for it or one way to do it. And now this is really cool because now we have some kind of a pluggable system. We can just plug in um, this class and, we, and now it's reusable. It doesn't need to know anything about the role model and we can reuse this hook. So in software engineering we also say it's like, like a hook where you can hook in stuff and it's just getting called, so it's this don't call us, we call you, because now the special code does not do anything um, with, with, the, with the outside. It's like the actual class, FastCGI, is calling with the include, it's calling um, the special class with this include. And that's really cool because it's now, now it's reusable, and yeah, and as I said, like, this is how it's called. It's like include after package install, and we just say um, include this special profile. And now it's a dependency, and it's clear that it's a dependency, but it's injected. So, as I said, like the PHP fast CGI class doesn't have to know anything about the implementation of this special stuff. It just executes it. Yeah, and this is, as I said, the Hollywood principle. High five time! Yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, I think I got that point too. So uh, now we got a clear PHP 5 FCGI class um, and uh, we got this, this clean hooks principle. So whenever um, I have some like indirections in my code and uh, someone is like executing code it's, it's, it's just not belonging to, I can implement this, this kind of a hook system. Yes. So the outer side can always just inject the piece of code which should be executed um, when the hook it's like, it's like triggered. So this is really, really cool. Um, okay, now uh, we still got um, this special PHP config oh, yeah. uh, for this Web App C, which is just, um, it's, it's, it's just a file, you know? Yeah, it's, a, it's just a file. Um, the pro problem here is um, it's just a file is a real big anti-pattern of configuration management because earlier we said, uh, we said that configuration management should be declarative and abstract and what we do now here is just put push some like in your bash script you just push some file to somewhere and this is a problem because it just encourages again copy and paste like imagine you have now a special php ini for web app a and then you will just go ahead and copy the special php from web app c and just change okay, some okay, stuff okay. yeah okay so but uh, tell me, how, how can I fix that? Yeah, so actually um, what we can do is we already, um, we again express stuff declarative. What we could do is like, 
we could say, hey, what, what, what does this express? It's like a special config for PHP and for our, for our PHP install. So why not express it in our code that it's actually a special config so anyone who reads this code just knows, ah, okay, it's a special config. And you just pass in, like we learned, like you pass in all the dependencies, like um, and show present, like it should be present by default, and then you can say, and you can also um, inject the pass, and it has an, a same default. And what you can do with now, then is like you could use um, a module for um, composing any files. So again, your any file, um, you don't just have this file, you just go ahead and just say, ah, oh, okay, it's an any setting and it has a title and it has a section and a key and a value. And the cool thing about it is you can test it again with your aspect puppet. You could just say, like, contain, um, should contain PHP special config, or you could test, should contain some any setting and stuff like that. And this is really cool because the other way to do it would be like testing it with regular expressions or really I, evil I stuff. This. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and this is this is really cool. And now this is this is again um, yeah, this is again this declarative stuff. So describe um, what should be done, not how it should be done. How it should be done should always be like hidden. For example, in this any setting module, which someone wrote somewhere, and you just download in your library folder, and they hopefully tested it. Yeah, right? and <laughs> hopefully they tested it, and it works. If they, if you find a bug, you can just go to GitHub, open pull request, fix it. Yeah, it's like in software engineering. Yeah. All right. High five time again. Uh, so we finally got got rid of my of my file server. Uh, Frankly, I had a like intimate relation with them, and it was really cool. But somehow, on the other hand, it was like really great that we that we moved it because we all we get all the advantages we had now with like the declarative programming, the idempotent and stuff. Uh, this is really cool, and this makes my like my daily work. And it, it's just way easier now uh, because I just have to say what should be done and not how. Um, and. I don't want to have my, my notes in, in, in Puppet, you know, because all the stuff you mentioned, um, what, what happens if I have to scale really hard? Like, uh, imagine, like, our marketing um, <laughs> department does some awesome advertisement on TV, and I expect, like, uh, the hundreds amount of views I'm getting now, and I have to do, I, I have to put all these notes I want to add in the, in the manifest again. So I have to yeah. add every note and so many lines of code. Um, can we just, just fix it? I guess we can. Let's just do some Google search and let's see how we can actually. So what we have to do is like we have to separate code and data. So our code is our code says, hey, include this class, blah, blah, blah. But the data actually is like we have thousands of nodes. And the thousand, and the thousand nodes should get this, like, this role model and stuff like that. So. Um, in the Puppet world, we actually, when we search for like separating data and code, we will find Hira, and Hira is a tool um, to get to get rid of all the data in your Puppet manifest and just push it. For example, this is really an example to YAML. So what we could do here is we can, could say like the Web One YAML, and we can, could also say like it should include the profile Web App A and so on. So we can just express how a node looks and we can do it, for example, in YAML, but, um, and actually our node definition now would be not like this, like repeating it all the time. We could just do hira include and this hira include would just look up what to do. Uh, okay, okay, okay. So um, I, I get this. I can just like define it externally and not in my puppet, but you know, YAML is still static, so why is the difference if I just enter my notes in the manifest yeah. and, and, uh, or any YAML file? Yeah, that's still a problem because, yeah, now we moved it, like, we, we moved the data out to another layer, but it's still there and it's still somehow copy but, and paste. But I would paste. bet you have a solution for that too. Yeah, <laughs> of course I have a solution for this because I'm Dr. Software. <laughs> <laughs> so, actually, the cool thing about Hira is it's pluggable and you can just 
do whatever you want. You can implement your own backend and you can use like getting stuff from DNS or from your existing um, LDAP stuff. Or you can just write your own backend because you have your you already have your like configuration management database and it contains all the nodes and maybe also the roles. Then you could just write a really thin layer or two, um, yeah, to express how a node should look like. And you could also do it like with um, um, connected to some APIs like an AWS or with CloudFormation or stuff like that. Actually, we, we did it uh, at Jimdo. We, we have some plugin like Hira AWS and just gets information out of AWS so we don't have to copy and paste it into, um, into Puppet. Yeah, and this is really cool because now actually we get a configuration management for our configuration <laughs> management. <laughs> Yeah, like Exhibit always tells us. And High five time! Again. All right, uh, so I, I got it. And it, it's really cool that I can manage my data center without any monkey task at all. It's just like when I plug in the node and I boot it, and the rest just happened automatically. Um, the node you know, is um, uh, registering itself at our AWS, for example, or LDAP or whatever, and then uh, Puppet can provision itself because we have this Hira backend. Uh, so it's really cool by just discovering nodes with Hira. Um, and this is like this is the real way of, of configuration management. Yeah. And I'm so thankful uh, that you showed me like how to do it and how to get rid of my of my NFS stuff. Um, okay, so <laughs> the role play is kind of over. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Don't don't hate me for my for my bad hair now. <laughs> it was really warm under there. Uh, okay, so <clears throat> uh, let's make a let's make a resume. Um, we have solid in software world for like a couple of years now already, and we always mentioned it's not it's not it, it's not a Jenga game like it was mentioned in the beginning uh, because it's very fragile and uh, you can break stuff really easy. It's more like Lego, you know? You have small parts, little modules, you can compose them whatever way you like and you can create new stuff with existing modules. Um, we often call this Lego programming because it's really like that. You don't program new mod modules, you're more like configuring stuff. You're putting existing systems together to create something new. And um, I can always like, Encourage you, uh, encourage you to to learn from software development world because all the configuration management stuff takes uh, so many or has so many similarities to software development, and it would be like a shame uh, <laughs> if we don't apply the stuff the software world already uses for so many years and, and don't apply it to configuration management. I mean, this is what we see in puppet world nowadays. Like they're making the exact same mistakes as PHP. We just discussed it yesterday, right? Yeah. Um, and this is so bad, and this really hurts me because I have seen PHP gone gone through all this shit, and it's really hard to see that they do exactly the same mistakes because they don't look at the software world, which is really bad. Um, and I guess Lunga has to tell us something about the I and the L because this yeah. one is still missing. Yeah, it's still missing, and yeah. So actually, we had like. Um, we don't have like um, this interface segregation, and the problem um, the problem here is um, that interface segregation doesn't really apply to Puppet because you don't have stuff like interfaces. In, in the software world, you have stuff like interfaces, and it should use small interfaces. It could apply somehow, like when your class or your define looks like oh, there are twenty. Params passed, then it's like a code smell, and you might look into how to break it into smaller classes or, or pieces. Yeah. yeah. But we were really curious. So if you know like a, a pattern or like a way of configuration management which is similar to interface aggregation, uh, we would love to discuss um, that with you afterwards. Yeah. Uh, because we were really like our goal for this talk was to apply all the software principles, like all the solid principles. But uh, like for the I, it was really hard to find something. Yeah, and it was even harder for for the L a little bit because the L is about um, how how inheritance works and actually like f in at least in Puppet it's like um, you have um, you can do inheritance but they all say don't do it <laughs> because it's like it's not there right yeah be because actually you should always use composition and not inheritance so just plug your 
plug your defines and classes together and don't do any inheritance. Yeah. Yeah, so what we got is like sort. <laughs> No, no problem. Yeah. No? Okay. Yeah. So we got sod. It's not solid, but uh, maybe we can in, in implement like this sod. So as we have solid in software world, you can go back to your company and say, "All right, I learned about sod," and all your colleagues will question like, hey, "What's sod? Never heard it." <laughs> and then you can go ahead and explain that uh, because it makes like configuration managed code, management code, just more solid. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, on, on the last um, part of the slide. Uh, we want to share some best practices we gathered, um, like real best practices, not this manly best practices, <laughs> like real best practices, which, which don't kill you. <laughs> um, the first one is like what um, we had a slice of that in, in the in the role play. Um, it's like the role model we got. So you have nodes in Puppet, and for us, every node has. Uh, one single role, it has not more roles, it's just really bound to one role. And this role consists of uh, several profiles, and the profile then has more modules, and they reuse resources. And talking about open source here, um, everything behind these modules should be open sourceable within a day. Yeah. And that day should be spent in writing documentation. This is a ru <laughs> yeah, it's the rule of thumb is like all your models should be yeah. open sourceable, and they should not like call stuff from modules or role or right. global namespace. I mean, we know we're talking about a world which is like, we are talking about the perfect world with you know, candy and rainbows <laughs> and unicorns. Uh, we don't have that too. Not all our modules are open source. <laughs> but whenever we write new stuff, we have this rule in mind and we try to program it like that, that we could open source it like any day. Um, yeah, so actually, um, we talked about like this open source, like in the Puppet community, you have the Puppet Forge. It's like Ruby Gems, or in the Ruby world, or whatever, or CPAN in the Perl world, and it's just yeah, a Puppet module registry. So before you're going to implement stuff on your own, better look there, because you might save some time. Yeah, there's also a pre-built PHP 5 module, but yeah. I wouldn't have learned so much if we would just have yeah. used so, it, right? Yeah, actually, actually we, sh we could have just used the PHP 5 module, yeah. But it would not have that learning right. effect for you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and the next one is uh, the dependency management, like all the modules which are open sourceable, um, you have kind of to manage them, right? And if, if you do it, you can like use good submodules or all the way like of, of don't doing it, but what can happy, happen pretty quickly is like that the city of Forks welcomes you because you're doing little fixes and you have no way to contribute it back, you have no way to manage your submodules in a correct manner, and you would end up like, uh, chaos pretty, pretty quickly. So what we can really recommend is like using pre-built tools for that. For example, there's Librarian Puppet. There's, how, how's it pronounced, like R R10K? R10K, uh, yes. It's like a best practices and code collection for, for Puppet modules. And um, talking about Chef, there's Berg Shelf. Um, and it's just little layers you can use in your like deployment process or in your Puppet yeah. Master, which pulls down all the modules you specify in a, in a dedicated file. If you do programming, uh, you might know tools like Bundler, um, PIP, Easy Install, and all the Python ones, um, or Peer, <laughs> or Composer in PHP world. Yeah, and so actually there's also, uh, in the Puppet world, there's some um, some guy and he does like like these standard models. It's a cool um, way to um, it's in like a standardization effort to how how modules should look like. So if you're going to write your own module, just have a look there how how to do it and how to do all this stuff. Like it should be generic and it should work maybe not only on your Ubuntu or Debian but also on whatever Fedora or even Windows, but... <laughs> yeah, let, let's give this yeah. for here. <laughs> um, it's pretty similar to what you might know as PEP8 or PSR, like all the programming tools, they have, they slowly come up with that too, like they have pretty hard standards and um, it makes the life of everyone easier if you just follow them. And if the majority of the community agrees on it, um, make your lives easier and just don't question it. <laughs> <laughs> but this is a really personal opinion. <laughs> Um, and this one we want to share from like our daily business we are doing. Um, Jimlo has obviously your GitHub account. 
and you can find some really cool stuff on that because what we do when we write a new module, uh, we have kind of a, a sandbox or template. Uh, we just fork that repo, uh, what you see there, the puppet skeleton. Um, and it contains a lot of pre-built stuff already. Like for example, that's README. It's almost completely written yeah. <laughs> because a lot of stuff is pretty similar to, to modules, to Puppet modules. You just have to like replace smaller parts, like how to use it, and not like uh, writing, um, for example, a license all the time. Uh, there's a pre-built manifest file. There's all the folder structure. Um, tests. There's even there's tests. It's, it's a complete test setup. It's already done in this sandbox, um, in this skeleton. There's a Vagrant file, and we have server spec in there. Yeah. So you can really do test-driven development um, and set up a new module within, I don't know, five minutes, because we have done all the stuff, all the repeatable work. And um, our coworker who did it, uh, Matthias Lafeld, he also did this for, for Chef. Um, and this is really cool. It makes development way easier. And Zunka mentioned the AWS um, Hira backend. And you can also find that one yeah, um, on in our Google. Jetup yeah. account. Yeah, so next one, like you just mentioned it, like there are um, also other tools to, ooh, to, to, ooh. Test, um, to, to test your manifest. Because what we did now is like with this aspect stuff, we just test that it might apply. But actually, we don't. It just compiles the Puppet catalog, but it doesn't test if it really works. And with the tools like server spec, um, um, it really just spins up a Vagrant box and, and just actually um, applies your manifest. And you can see it. And you can also combine it again with this R spec. And then it, it's really like what, what, what we showed you, like with this, it should install blah, blah, blah. And then you can just get a real cool integration test if your module really works and if it really works, for example, not only on your Ubuntu, but also on a Fedora, because you can just implement more um, or um, plug in more vagrant boxes and stuff like that. Yeah, and the other tool is relatively new. Also, um, so server spec is agnostic. It's for Chef, at least for Chef and Puppet. Beaker is Puppet specific and it's really cool because you can also say like on the master, on the Puppet master, there should um, just happen this and on the node there should happen this and stuff like that. So it's a really cool integration tool. It's relatively new. Yeah. Uh, all yeah. right. Uh, that's all we got. Thank you very much. <laughs>And now we got like seven minutes for questions, if you got some. And if you don't want to ask now, um, we are around for the next two days, and you can always find us around here and ask us stuff about like how we do it or discuss stuff with us because we talk completely bullshit. Uh, we also want to know that. So questions. <laughs> The syntax there above that is that this is the test and now this is the implementation. Mm -hmm. What's quite familiar with this uh, with the syntax that you know it looks like puppet, but where does it come from? Is it ah, it's uh, so so the quest the question was what what's the what syntax yeah so what what what's the syntax for what's the syntax for um, the testing? It was uh, R spec, it's Ruby. So this describe and it should blah blah blah, this is actually this is actually Ruby code. RSpec is just a testing framework for Ruby, yeah. yeah so yeah. Correct. It's RSpec Puppet. Uh, so so there is there is RSpec and there's one guy and he wrote RSpec Puppet, which is just an extension for RSpec, and you can can just test this catalog stuff with it. Yeah. More questions? Yeah. Hmm? Sorry? How do you actually test your servers? So the question was, how do we actually test our servers? So actually, we don't. Uh, yeah, so that's we test so easy. <laughs> so, so, what we, so what we do is we, we try to write tests for everything. So like with this aspect puppet. And if it's green, then it's OK for us. Then we just merge it, and puppet runs every hour and just applies and if it so actually we never had a bad case like puppet goes weird and maybe 
uninstalls itself or stuff like that. Or <laughs> so yeah, so actually we never had problems and we also have just like one branch and we just work with pull requests, like we open the pull request then Travis is going, so, so the continuous integration is going to test, execute all the tests and if it's green and somebody um, reviewed the code, then we can merge it and then it goes live within the next hour. But there are, but I know that you, you could just, with continuous integration, you could do stuff like spin up a machine somewhere and apply the, apply the stuff and just look if the web server runs and you could do some more smoke testing. Yeah. I guess the actual question would be is like, is it really necessary to test the service if you have like a, a completely covered um, puppet for or a chef file? Um, I mean, testing always takes uh, at least like development time or like the time you have to write the tests. And if you do like real server testing, you need the server resources, you need a free server to do it. And like spinning up the machine, if you would do it like that, it would also take time and it will slow down development because your feature will take more time to go out. And what I learned like in software development testing is like people tend to test all this stuff. Um, some people even test like getters and setters, so they test like I set this variable and then the next line they test if this is this variable set, uh, which is kind of bullshit for me yeah. um, because you should only test like business critical stuff. Um, I know that in server server world, a lot of stuff is business critical when it's like all, all the stuff is business critical, but uh, like you should only test like fragile parts, not this like okay, I install a package and if this is this package installed, it yeah. uh, might not be a test which is like, really necessary on a real world. But, yeah, maybe I'm wrong, so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, you, your puppet receives deploy a server, but there's no guarantee that the Tomcat, whatever, would start up, that the application would work, that it would like its database, and so on. Yeah, so, um, so actually, um, yeah, so the, the, the problem is, like, how do you know that if you spin up a new machine, how do you know that all your services are up? So actually, so we do it like we have like automated monitoring for it because the puppet also sets up the monitoring like if is Tomcat running? And so because the node definition just includes also the monitoring and the node then re registers itself in the monitoring system and then you can just see it in the monitoring if it's up and so for us, that's really enough because we can see it in the monitoring and the monitoring is the single source of truth if stuff works or not. So yeah, we just do it with monitoring then. Uh, I guess we have time for one last question, if there's one. Um, so the question was if we run Puppet as a daemon, the agent as a daemon. No, we don't. We run it hourly. Um, we, there's, there's a cool tool um, um, one of our co-workers wrote. It's called Periodic Noise. It's a small Go tool and it's for all the stuff like I have cron jobs and cron jobs tend to fail and then someone gets a mail and or not or he's on vacation and so what he did is like all the stuff what you need for um, periodic tasks um, like um, doing like um, spreading it out for an interval so for example you don't want that all your puppet agents start at zero because then your master gets overloaded so it just spreads it out over 20 minutes and it actually if it fails then it will just um, so we we have also a, a puppet module for it like puppet periodic noise and we can just go into puppet and say we have a monitored cron, so we do a cron job, but it's monitored because periodic noise also integrates into the monitoring and it just says like, oh my god, the puppet run failed and then it's getting read in our monitoring system. Or, it's, or like it's getting read after two times because there could be some network glitch or whatever and we ju just don't care about one failing run. And the periodic noise also takes care of locking, like uh, guarantee that the process is not run um, per in parallel, and it also does logging. Yeah, it does. Um, it does all the stuff you implement your, on your own all the time. So yeah. please use it. Yeah. So it's and, and it's also up on GitHub. So um, just check it out. Uh, all right. I guess that's it. Um, if you have any qu further questions, whatever, just come and find us. Thank you very yeah. much. Thanks. <laughs>